Hello, and thank you for joining today's Environment and Energy Leader webinar titled Simplifying the Complex, a Quick Start Guide to Air Dispersion Modeling, sponsored by Montrose Environmental. My name is Jessica Hunt, and I am the Director of Live Events for E&E Leader. Before we get started with the presentation, I want to go over a few housekeeping items with attendees. If you experience any technical difficulties during today's event, please follow the troubleshooting steps located in the help widget at the bottom of your page. If you are still having technical issues after performing the steps, please send a message to me using the Q&A widget located on the top right part of your screen. We will be holding a Q&A session at the conclusion of today's event, so if you have questions for the speakers, please submit over the next 45 to 50 minutes. If we do not get a chance to answer your question during the live event, the speakers or a member of their team will follow up with you as soon as possible. Additionally, attendees can chat with each other via the blue group chat widget at the bottom of your console. First up for Montrose Environmental, we have Pilar Kader Johansson. She is a senior consultant for Montrose Environmental and has conducted and managed multiple air dispersion modeling analysis for both prevention of significant deterioration and state permitting projects. She has performed numerous toxic impact modeling assessments in several states, including Georgia, Michigan, Ohio, South Carolina, and North Carolina. Prior to environmental consulting, Pilar provided process development support to clients working on innovative technologies for fuel production. Our second speaker, Santosh Chandru, is also a senior consultant at Montrose Environmental. Santosh has over a decade of experience in the field of air quality management and other regulatory programs. He has performed emissions inventories and completed regulatory and compliance reporting documentation for facilities in, very, in a variety of industries. And at this point, I'm going to turn the presentation over to our speakers, and I will rejoin the discussion for the Q&A portion of today's event. Thank you, Jessica, for having us here today. We're looking forward to presenting on this topic. And good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. The objective of this webinar is to give you a general understanding of what air dispersion modeling is. Some people have told me air dispersion modeling is just like a black box. You put your inputs and you get your outputs. Well, that is true, but it's not a magical black box. There's a lot that goes into it, and understanding what data is needed, what and how the data can be modified, what the limitations of the model formulation are is critical for developing the best modeling solutions and even permitting strategy. We are going to go over some of the regulations that require modeling to be conducted, the fundamentals of air dispersion modeling. These are the fundamental concepts that we need to understand in order to uncover that black box. And we will go over EPA preferred and recommended refined and screening models. We will give you an overview of AirMod, which is one of those preferred models by EPA. And AirMod is also the model that is used uh, most frequently for air permit applications. And finally, we will go over some case studies that should hopefully help put everything in perspective. Now, what is air dispersion modeling and when is it required? Air dispersion modeling is the term used to describe using mathematical theory to understand or to predict the way that pollutants behave in the atmosphere. It is performed with computer programs that include all the logarithms to solve the mathematical equations related to pollutant dispersion. Some of the factors that go into the modeling include the stack parameters, velocity, temperature, diameter, height, Plume rise calculations, which define how the plume will rise after it exits, exits the stack. Dispersion coefficients, which predict how the plume will behave and travel. Meteorological data, wind speed, wind direction, and temperature, which can also affect the dispersion of the plume. Building dimensions as well, because the surrounding buildings can create downwash for nearby sources, and they pull the plume down and the location of the receptors. These are the points where the model is calculating the concentration of the air pollutant being modeled. Let's take a look at some of the regulations that require air dispersion modeling. 
Dispersion models can be used to determine whether a new source or state changes to an existing source will adversely impact an area. For example, they're used to determine compliance with the National Ambient Air Quality Standards, or the NAS, for prevention of significant deterioration regulation. We will go into more detail on this. Some states have specific modeling requirements. Some states have requirements for criteria pollutants, and some states have requirements for toxic air pollutants, and some for both. Modeling is also used for the development of regulations that you, as it can predict whether the control of an individual source will have a beneficial effect. An example of this is what's happening with ethylene oxide right now. Basically, EPA recently updated its cancer risk value, meaning that they're seeing it's more carcinogenic than they previously thought. EPA is working with state agencies, and state agencies are getting information from facilities that have ethylene oxide emissions. What we're discussing in the previous slide, they're getting staff parameters, building dimensions, et cetera, and modeling to see what the impacts are on residential areas. And this is going to help them decide if any emission control requirements will need to be implemented for these sites. As modeling can sort of predict the future, uh, it is also used in engineering assessments. So say you wanted to model the stacks in this picture a different height to determine new impacts, so you could do that with modeling. They're also used to model chemical releases. As I mentioned before, some states have state modeling requirements that generally apply when you're constructing or modifying a facility. These requirements are very state-specific, sometimes even county-specific. Even what triggers modeling is different from state to state. And some of the thresholds could be very low, meaning that a lot of facilities could trigger modeling. You can find these requirements in either the state or local regulations, or sometimes they're just in guidance documents. Some states require modeling for criteria pollutant, like SO2 and NO2, and some states require modeling for air toxics, like ethylene oxide. I think it's important to know that an air toxic is not necessarily a hazardous air pollutant. EPA determines which are hazardous air pollutants and the local agency determines what an air toxic is. For example, in the top image to the right, you can see a comparison of what EPA considers a hazardous air pollutant in the purple circle and what North Carolina considers a toxic air pollutant in the yellow circle. Some overlap and some don't. Let me start this slide by asking you not to look at all of this flowchart just yet. We're going to walk through it in a minute, but when a major stationary source is constructed or it is modified and has potential emissions of a pollutant above a PSD permitting threshold, a more complex air dispersion modeling assessment is required. I took this flowchart from a state PSD modeling guidance because it had most of the components of the PSD modeling elements, but some of these elements vary by state. And I will now go over in detail on each of these components because that would take a complete day, but I wanted to give you an overview of what a PSD modeling assessment involves. Let's suppose we have a new line at a major source that has potential emissions above its significant emission rate, or SER. If the facility did not want to take a PSD avoidance limit, then PSD modeling would be required. First, we would have to conduct a modeling assessment to determine if pre-construction monitoring would be required. Then, if the facility is located near a Federal One class area, these are pristine or more protected areas like national parks, national wilderness areas, then we have to conduct a class one area analysis. And that may involve several steps, as you can see, and even communications with the federal land manager. At this point, you're no longer working with just your local environmental agency. Next, we conduct a class two analysis. Basically, everything outside of a class one area is a class two area right now. And we start with modeling just the project by itself. If, those, if the results from that modeling assessment are greater than the significant impact levels, then we have to complete a cumulative analysis. At this point, we're looking at the new project, 
we're looking at your size and any additional offsite sources that would need to be included. Offsite sources means other facilities near your facility, like a cement plant down the road. There are also other analysis that need to be completed, like soil and vegetation assessment, growth assessment, and class two visibility in permanent assessment. Secondary PM 2.5 and ozone impacts now also need to be evaluated. Red PM emissions is what the source emits at the stack directly at PM, and direct ozone emissions are not evaluated. Now, secondary PM and ozone emissions are formed from chemical reaction of gases that is not in DOC for ozone and not in SO2 for PM 2.5. This year, EPA released the draft PM 2.5 and ozone modeling guidance where they go over the recommended approaches for assessing secondary impacts. This table is from that guidance. So as you can see in the first case, uh, if you're not in DOC, which is your ozone precursors, emissions are less than the significant emission rate, then you don't need to evaluate secondary impacts. Now, if you're not, and or your VOC emissions are greater than the significant emission rate, which is 40 tons per year, then you need to go move on to a tier one approach, which is the modeling emission rates for precursors. And if that's not acceptable, then you may need to move on to a more complicated tier two approach, which is chemical transfer modeling. Now, the table is again from the same new guidance but this is for primary and secondary PM 2.5 emissions, so not in SO2 are the precursors. And it follows a very similar approach, uh, but I did want to point out case four, which is if you have your direct PM 2.5 emissions, so this is coming directly out of your stack as PM 2.5, less than the significant emission rate, but you're not and our SO2 emissions are greater than the significant emission rate, then you do have to move on to evaluating secondary impacts. Whenever you're doing a modeling assessment, it is very critical to review the correct modeling guidance. And it's not as simple as it sounds because there is a lot of guidance and even a lot of outdated guidance out there as well. Appendix W, or the Guideline on Air Quality Models, can be found on 40 CFR Part 51. And the purpose of Appendix W is to promote consistency in the application of air quality models for regulatory purposes. Appendix W is not just the guidance, it is the regulation, so it does need to be followed on most occasions. And all changes to Appendix W have to follow rulemaking requirements. That is why EPA does use guidance documents to provide more detailed guidance on different topics. Appendix W is pretty general, though. The new Source Review Workshop Manual has a lot more detailed guidance when it comes to NSR modeling requirements. But if you do use it, I'd say use it with caution. This guidance was issued in 1990, and as you could expect, it has some outdated information. The Support Center for Regulatory Air Models, or SCRAM, has the air dispersion models, the executable files, you can go there, you can download them, and you can even run them in your computer, and you can also access all of the modeling guidance. And as I mentioned before, most states that require state modeling have their own modeling guidance, some from criteria pollutants, some for toxic air pollutants, and some even for special emission sources. For example, here in Georgia, we have different model guidance documents for PSD applications, for toxic air dispersion modeling, and even a different one for quarry. So just be sure to check all applicable guidance and that it's all up to date. You can find EPA's preferred and recommended models in Appendix W. Preferred and recommended means that a case-by-case -case justification is not needed to use this, these models. That is if you are using them in the regulatory default mode. They are divided into refined models and screening models. Screening models are designed to provide a more conservative estimate of concentration, and they're also meant to be easier to use. They require less data, and they require less time than refined models. They're designed to be used for when you only have one source, but you could use them in some cases to address multiple sources as well. 
Airstream is the screening model for AirMod, and CTS Screen is the screening model for CTM Plus. AirMod is required for most regulatory applications, like I mentioned in previous slides, so we will go into more detail for this model. And now my colleague Santos will go over some of the key modeling concepts. Thank you, Pilar. Now that uh, Pilar has actually set the, the groundwork on what is the driver for doing these models and these modeling assessments, uh, let's take a look into the key modeling concepts uh, that you have to think about when analyzing the data and also when you're adding the inputs. The first one is building downwash. Now, what's building downwash? Uh, in the figure that you are seeing in front of you, you will see that there is a facility, and then you also see the stack. Uh, in this particular case, you will see that the stack is clearly a tall stack, and it goes above the height of these buildings. That need not be the case at all times. But for this example, let's take this. Uh, this is a good one to use. What typically happens is that in this, as shown in this case, the wind is flowing <clears throat> from the left, going towards the right direction. And as the wind is passing through the building structures, if you notice the lower points on the right-hand side of the building, you will start to see that because of the air movement through these buildings, eddies are being formed. That means there is more, uh, the, the air, air particles are being mixed and a lot of, lot of turbulence happening in that zone. That area is very critical, especially if you have your property boundary or your fence line right in that area. And if your pollutant emissions are significant enough, there is a high likelihood that it is in this area that you will start to see uh, concentrations that are pretty high. So one thing to keep in mind when you are designing buildings as well as designing stacks. Now the second thing to look about, this is specifically for the stack, is the plume rise and the stack tip downwash. Now what's the plume rise? As the exhaust air is coming out of the stack, based on the airflow through the stack and the exhaust temperature, the, the, the exhaust gases are lifted and based on the direction of the wind as well as the velocity, wind velocity, uh, you will start to see that it gets dispersed in in a particular way, and that is shown actually in the right right figure that you see in front of you. The, the top portion is typically the undisturbed flow where the, the primary interaction is going to happen based on the flow of the air only. Um, and a little bit and a little bit on the exhaust parameters as well. The the second one being the stack downwash. The stack downwash is an area where you will start to see the interaction because of the physical location of the stack as well, as well as the exhaust characteristics of the plume. There is, there is, a, there is some interaction between the two of them, and you will start to see the impact over there. That's the stack downwash zone. And the third zone that you see at the bottom is the building downwash, which we just explained in the previous figure that there is influence of the building in that uh, downwash area. You see specifically the plume rise, it is shown on the left side figure uh, that um, you have to account for the plume rise because the actual height of the stack uh, is not the true height at which the exhaust is happening. You should consider the plume rise because of the buoyancy associated to the exhaust air. The next important data input that we will talk about is meteorological data. 
uh, such as wind speed and direction, temperature, mixing height, etc. Now, these parameters come typically uh, from the MET station data, and MET stations are, are generally located at or near airports, uh, and also locations, uh, rural locations, as well as other locations that are specifically identified uh, by the state or on an EPA level. Other important parameters uh, used are land use parameters, such as surface roughness, that is how how the how the surface looks. Is it a, a mountainous surface? Is it a flat land, etc.? Uh, the next one is an albedo ratio. An albedo ratio is basically the amount of sunlight that gets reflected back uh, into the atmosphere. And the Bowen ratio. Now, what does the Bowen ratio tell? Uh, the Bowen ratio is typically talks about the amount of water that is present in a particular area, and that in turn in turn converts into the diffusion and convection characteristics for that particular area. So uh, it, it talks about sensible heat versus latent heat, and one more key characteristic. And as the name suggests, these are all land use parameters. Uh, we use the air surface model to determine what particular land characteristics apply to your specific location. And the last key parameter is also rural versus urban. Now, uh, if um, we are in Atlanta, so if we were to set up a, a model run and the facility is going to be at or very close to the Atlanta area, it will be considered as an urban location. But if I were to travel, let's say, 50, 50 miles uh, south of Atlanta, that starts to become uh, really rural areas. So, so we, that's, again, an important characteristic that, that is to be uh, seen inside the model. The land use parameters also determine the turbulence that, we will be, that the model will be using internally. Uh, for its uh, for its uh, convection and diffusion equations, uh, one is the convective turbulence, and the other is a mechanical turbulence. And mechanical turbulence, as you can see on the right image, it's basically based on the surface characteristics. Whether it's a mountainous area or a flat area, etc. Now, convective turbulence is primarily because of the pressure change as well as the temperature uh, between the various surface layers that you can see. Uh, it, it is more so of the mixing characteristics that will happen as the day progresses. There will be more mixing happening of the air particles as well. So that's the convective turbulence part, which the which the uh, model automatically takes into consideration based on the land use characteristics and parameters that you have set inside. Now that we have taken a look into the key concepts used in modeling, as Pilar mentioned uh, before, AirMod is the preferred dispersion model used for air permitting purposes. Pilar is now going to go through some of the input characteristics of AirMod and what do you need to do specifically and how AirMod operates. This is a high-level overview of AirMod, all of its preprocessors, and data requirements. Well, first, we have BPIP prime. And for that, we need the building dimensions and the stack parameters. And that gives us the projected building dimensions. This is your down launch. Next, we have air maps. So we have our terrain data, our receptor locations, and our source locations. And that gives us the receptors and source locations with the elevations. And then we have AirMet. This is the meteorological preprocessor. So for that, we have our upper air observations, our surface data. Uh, sometimes we have site-specific surface data. And we also have another preprocessor, which is air surface. So that takes your national length covered database and gives you your surface characteristics. And then you also have one minute ACES data that goes into air minute and it gives you hourly average winds. 
So this now gives you your profile and your surface files, which sometimes you get them from your state website. And now that you have your building downwash, you have your sources and your receptors with elevations and your meteorological data, you can input your emissions. And depending on the modeling assessment that you're doing, you might need also background concentration. And all that goes into AirMod, and you can have an output that is in the design values or the appropriate metrics to determine compliance with whichever pollutant you're modeling. What exactly goes into AirMod? So first you have your control data. This includes your dispersion options. You determine with air surface, whether it was a rural area or an urban area. Then your pollutant, whether it's NO2, SO2, or PM2.5, and your averaging time options, because each of these pollutants has a different averaging time. And you have your terrain options and your non-default options as well. Next, you have your source data, the base elevation, the location. And one key thing to know here is what your type of source is or how to appropriately represent and model your source. So there's different source types, and we'll go into a little more detail in the next slide. And then your source release parameters, and then source groups. If you want to take a look at the impact from one of your stacks or two of your stacks, then you can put that in a source group, and you can see their impact separately as well. The point source is the most common type of release. It is a traditional stack. Examples would be combustion equipment stacks, so closed fixture tanks or bag houses with stacks. They can be vertical and unobstructed, which would be the point source here. Or you could use the point cap if your stack is obstructed, like if it has a rain cap. And then if your stack is coming on the side of the building, you could use the point horizontal. The point cap and point horizontal options were somewhat recently incorporated into the formulation of air mode. So if you have facilities that were modeled with the old school way of representing these type of sources, your results could be different now. So far, I have seen improvements in the results. The volume source type is used to model releases that occur over a three-dimensional volume. Examples would be fugitive leaks, multiple vents, slope conveyor belts, wipe cleaning, or general solvent usage. Area sources are used to model low-level or ground-level releases where the releases occur over an area. So examples of that would be landfills, storage piles, flag dumps, and lagoons. After you have determined what type of source uh, you will be modeling, then you have to add your receptors. This is where the concentrations will be calculated by the model. So you can see here there are no receptors located inside the facility, and the receptors are located along the fence line or the property line, and that's going to depend on the type of modeling evaluation that you're doing or even the state that you're doing the modeling evaluation. The receptors can be placed on grids, like in this image, or they can be placed on discrete locations if you have a point of interest. In this case, we were looking at, we were interested in the results in a residential area that was right next to a facility on each side, so we applied a much denser grid on this uh, location for that. And then you have your meteorological data and your terrain data. Lastly, you need to set your output options. You can do tables or contour plots. Like in this image, you can see how the concentration, concentration is changing. Or you can do contribution files or threshold violation files. Say you were exceeding the standard at a particular point. And this, with this file, so you can find out if there's a specific stack from your facility that is the issue or even if it's not your site, but it's contributing to an exceedance, but maybe your next door neighbor if you're modeling off-site sources. This is what an AirMod input file looks like. I wanted to show you because it is important to understand this file if you're doing a lot of modeling. 
it is sometimes the best place to catch some of the errors. So here we can see our control options, our source data, and our building downwash. And this is what that error mode file looks like, but now we're looking at it with a graphical user interface or a GUI. As you can imagine, viewing and editing things graphically can be very helpful. Now this is what an ear mode output file looks like. This is a contour plot. The different colors here represent a different concentration. In this case, let's say our standard was 3 times 10 to the negative 2 micrograms per meters cubed. Then that means anything in red, we would be exceeding the standard. This also means that we're exceeding the standard outside of the facility fence line. And at this point, we would have to conduct additional modeling or look into other ways of reducing impact. Now, my colleague Santos will be going over some very interesting case studies that should hopefully help bring all of this information together. Okay, the first case study that we are going to do is a toxics. Um, in this case, we have chosen for the state of Georgia. Uh, and as you, most of you may be well aware that there is a lot of traction that is happening across the country for ethylene oxide, uh, considering the case that EPA uh, significantly increased the cancer risk from this particular pollutant. In this case, let's take the example of a facility that is going to be constructed and the expected emissions is one pound per year of ethylene oxide. Now, for Georgia, as per the Georgia air toxics model, the first thing that we will be doing is checking against whether you actually need modeling. And for that, uh, the state has actually put forth an MER table, uh, the maximum emission rate, below which you do not require any modeling. All you will have to do is document that your emissions are below the MER and no further modeling would be required. In this particular case, the MER for ethylene oxide is 0 0.08 pound per year. So clearly our facility is higher than that MER, so it will require modeling. And a couple of other things that to be noted in this particular example for ethylene oxide is that the risk the ambient air concentrations that is allowed, uh, that is for general public, uh, is also listed over there, uh, which is an iris standard uh, for 3.3 to 10 raised to minus 4 and a 15-minute short-term standard of 900 microgram per cubic meter. Now, once we do the modeling, let's say we find out that our 15 minute is at 800 microgram per cubic meter and our annual is at 3.3 into 10 raised to minus 1 microgram per cubic meter. Well, we do clearly pass for the 15 minute, but we do not pass for the annual. Now, what do we need to do? One, and that's where our input parameters become critical. Few options that you can think about in this particular case is can you add? Uh, control devices. Two, can you limit your operations for the entire year since it's an annual annual standard that we are exceeding? Can you limit your operation based on the hours of operation per year? Or can you make any other stack adjustments? Or is it any of the buildings that is causing a downwash? So several options that you can think about in this particular case. Let's take another example in this case, and uh, we'll do for NO2 modeling. In this example, we have a PhD major source that is planning to add a new line with NOx emissions that is at 219 tons per year. Based on an earlier slide that uh, Pilar had shared, the significant emission rate above which modeling is required for NOx is 40 tons per year. So you will have to model. Now let's say we go through the modeling analysis and we find out that on an annual averaging, our concentration comes at, our max concentration comes at 0.5 and our one hour concentration comes at 70. 
Now, these two are compared against the class two significant impact levels. Now, what, what is a class two area? Class two area is anything that is not a class one area. Now, what's a class one area? Class one areas are typically protected areas such as national parks, wildlife refuge areas, etc. In this particular example, you can see that uh, the annual concentration is fine. However, the one hour concentration has been exceeded. Now, what does that trigger is one of the things that you will have to do is you will have to go for a full blown impact analysis. That will be, and the concentrations will be compared against the class two max. In this case, uh, since our annual concentrations were fine, we don't have to go forward for the full blown analysis. But for the one hour, we will have to go forward. And what we find out here is that with the full blown analysis, which will also take into account other sources, that is sources apart from you that are present near to your area are taken into consideration as well. We find out that we are at 190 microgram per cubic meter while the max is at 188. So what does that uh, indicate? That we are exceeding on a one hour standard. So now again, with this analysis, without making any changes, you will not be able to go for, for further for requesting the air permit. So you will have to make some changes, whether that is um, stack changes or um, buy additional property uh, or control device changes, etc. So these are the options that are available. We're looking at these two examples. A uh, few things we have to keep into mind uh, while developing a permitting strategy is that the short term NO2 and SO2 standards may be a limiting factor. Now, modeling may be able to demonstrate that the project is infeasible because of uh, your parameters or your concentration or your emissions, etc. And that's where this is also a key part where an early communication with agency is highly recommended and to get a buy-in from the agency, right from what meteorological data you would be using, uh, what air surface data you would be using, and uh, the division should be able to provide you uh, good information that, that will help you uh, go forward with your exercise and, and not have surprises uh, towards the end. few tips to make sure that your modeling makes sense and is proceeding in the right direction. One, always check your input data to see if it makes sense. Are the units correct? Are the pollutants corresponding to the right averaging period that is needed? Make sure you are well, clearly aware whether it's a fence line versus property line. Make sure that your emission rates then when you compute are short term or long term and make the differentiation appropriately. And also use the most current modeling guidance from the state or EPA, uh, whichever your particular state is following through. And our last slide over here gives some resources for checking onto the EPA's website for modeling and our contacts here for both Pilar and myself, and we'll be happy to connect with you uh, with any of your modeling or permitting questions that you may have. Thank you, Pilar and Santosh, for a fantastic presentation today. I am thrilled that we do have quite a bit of time for the Q&A session today. I do appreciate attendees who have submitted questions prior to now in the presentation. Please continue submitting during the next 15 minutes or so, and hopefully we will get a chance to answer your question. So let's get started. Pilar, the first question is for you. How much does a modeling exercise cost? 
Yeah, yes, Jessica. So the cause will depend on several factors. So let's say for an air toxic, it could range from $3,000 to $15,000. And that will depend on the complexity of the issue, whether we're using screening or refined models, and even the number of pollutants that we would be evaluating. And then for a PSD modeling, it is a little bit more difficult to estimate just because it varies even state to state. You know, some states provide a lot of background information like off-site sources and, and some don't, so you need to gather that information. So I would say generally about 20,000 for a simple case to, you know, upwards from there. Thank you for that. And Santosh, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, toss the next question over to you. How long does it take to complete this modeling? That's a good question, uh, Jessica. That, uh, Simple exercises, typically, let's say if it's a toxic model and uh, we are able to get all data, uh, the turnaround time can be anywhere uh, from a couple of weeks to a month or so. But when we start to talk about complex projects, uh, PSD, that definitely increases the time. And also, I mean, there are other factors to be considered as well. One, the accessibility of the data from the facility to interactions with the agency as well. Uh, we have been fortunate that we work with some of the best agencies and most of them are so helpful. Uh, but at, at there are times in which the agency is tied up as well and it takes some time for them to either provide us the metadata or to approve the modeling protocol, which is one, one of the key steps uh, involved in modeling is to get a protocol prepared to the agency uh, and get it approved. So if we if we start to get into complexities uh, for PSD, et cetera, we are talking a, a minimum of two months and, and more uh, going forward. Okay, thank you for that. And if by chance you cannot get a passing model, what happens? Well, th there are many things that we would look at at this point. So I think we would generally start looking at the model itself. Is there anything that we can do differently with the model? And then if we still don't pass, then we would work closely with the team um, and try to find a passing scenario. Sometimes it's refining emission rate, being a little less conservative on the emission rates as long as it's acceptable to the agency. Or sometimes it's refining stack parameters. Maybe we, we were missing a foot off the stack you know, that we didn't get correct. And after we look at all of our options and we find a passing scenario, then we would work with the site to try to get the most flexibility for the least amount of cost. But at this point, it's just looking at all the available options so we can choose the best path. Which definitely makes complete sense. So thank you for going over um, that in detail with us. I think it's, the next question has to do with the facility construction, which I we built our house recently. So I know going back and forth with different models, obviously it's a different type of scenario, but it's it's interesting to see different um, applications of this. But Santosh, this question is for you. If your facility construction was different from the original design that was modeled, will you need to go back and redo the modeling exercise? That's a great question. Um, this is one question that uh, comes up very, very often. Um, so, to so to tell a one straight answer, it would be it's on a case by case basis. Um, sometimes it is absolutely a clear indication that uh, I'll, I'll take a couple of examples here. Uh, let's consider the case of um, uh, if all parameters except your stack height changes your stack height increases, let's put it that way, that your stack height is going to increase, but all other parameters, whether it's emissions data or flow characteristics, all those things are remaining the same. On a dispersion level, you are going to be improving the dispersion uh, from what you had previously modeled. Uh, at, at that time, it is generally a good idea to touch base with the agency that you're working with. Uh, and there is a likelihood that the agency may say, depending on the scenario, that you probably don't need to rerun it uh, if if it is uh, because you had already submitted a case which was more conservative than you are at this time. Uh, but again, it is on a case by case basis. However, let me take a second scenario where your stack height decreases, 
then it is almost certain that the agency will request you to redo the modeling so that the most up-to-date modeling is in file. Now, there are scenarios for PSD. If it's a PSD source, in most cases, you will have to redo, whether you're increasing or decreasing, uh, as the most accurate information need to be present with the state agencies and EPA as well. Uh, but if it is at the discretion of, um, of state agencies, um, gen for, for cases such as air toxics, which are generally state uh, covered, uh, always it's a good idea to talk to them and uh, get their uh, get their idea about it. Which I completely understand. I do appreciate you giving a couple of different scenarios because I know it's not a one size fits all for something like this. So thank you for going into detail. Um, our next question has to do about validating model, res mo model results. So how do you typically validate models, model results? Sorry about that. So, uh, Santosh, did you want to take that one, or did you want me to take that one? Oh, sure, sure. I, I can I can take that one. Um, so, so when you when you say how do you validate it, it of course it it starts from the first step of uh, making sure your input data is correct. Um, and we start from that point: is is your are all the inputs correct? Have you chosen the right? Uh, Right parameter settings uh, into into account. Is your land use characteristics proper? Um, and after that, uh, and, and first of all, does the data even make sense? That would be the first question that you will have to do. Uh, in it, I'm talking very specifically with related to air mod, uh, and uh, typically that's the approach that you would start to see and start to understand where the you start to look at the contour plots to see where the impacts are happening. Um, there are issues that will start to arise also if your inputs are not correct. For example, if you have not taken into consideration the floor height properly, that is uh, the, the mean sea level height, um, all those things will make a difference when you're analyzing the model. So you definitely want to check your input parameters as well as the input settings. You start from that uh, and then go forward to make sense whether your uh, model is, it, it is making some sense for uh, when you start seeing the data. Thank you for that explanation. And the next question kind of piggybacks on, on that one, Pilar, I don't know if you want to take this one, but it has to do with data. So where can you find, or where would, where would someone find data to construct model input, such as meteoro meteorological data and terrain data? Yeah, so if you if you go to EPA's SCRAM website, it usually has where you can find most, most of the things, and that's usually for terrain data. They just have a new, they just updated the map where you can get the data. So now it's, that's a little bit easier. Um, for a while, we had to do a lot of tricks just to get the data, but for meteorological data, usually your um, state website will have it. It depends on what state you're in. And then you have to prove that it's representative for the site. And in other cases, you might have to create the meteorological data. And at that point, you are getting the data from many different sources. So it really all depends on the case, but um, it, 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 it's kind of in different locations. But I would say meteorological data starts with your state website. And for, um, for terrain data, uh, Graham has where to go from there. Okay, thank you for that. And I, I know that if the person who answered that or submitted that question, if you have additional um, follow-up questions, please feel free to contact either of the speakers today. You can contact them via email. It is, their email is available on your attendee console. So we do have time for a few more questions. This one is about the air mod. About air mod. Does the air mod take into account chemical reactions in the atmosphere? Pilar, did you want to take that one? Yeah, sure. Um, so that's a, a yes and a no. So it depends on the pollutant. For NO2, uh, for example, you're initially you're looking at NOx emissions, and then there's several peers you can use. Uh, one, assuming that all NOx turns into NO2, and then tier two, assuming that a fraction, and then tier three, then it takes into account the ozone in the air with two different methods uh, for the tier three. So in that case, 
it kind of takes into account the reactions in the atmosphere, but not for every balloon. So if you're modeling a toxic, for example, it's not going to take into account what's happening in the air, and it's just using the emission rate coming out of the stack. So I guess the answer is it'll depend on the pollutant that you're modeling. Again, which can make complete sense. Obviously, everyone that you work with is going to be a case-by-case -case basis um, on what they, what, what they need to do, which kind of brings me to the next question and this it actually would probably be a good question for both of you to answer if if you're working with a company do you most do you find most of the time that they automatically look to work with a consultant right away or have they tried to do this themselves on their with their own team before seeking out the services of a consultant i can dig that uh, pilar um that's a loaded question there <laughs> um I have no doubt. The, so. <laughs> um, the, the answer would be absolutely the facility. All these air mod, if you think about it, is actually an open, uh, it's available on EPA's website. It's an open source. So anyone can actually download it and run the model once you understand the basics of it and take it forward from there. Uh, so can you, can you will you be able to run it yourself? Uh, absolutely, with, with some bit of... Uh, of uh, science background and an understanding of uh, technology, absolutely you'll be able to do it yourself. Now, would 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 facilities always run it themselves and not use a consultant? Uh, it's a mixed bag what we have seen. If you have a good enough team, and, uh, let, and in most cases what we see is that the EHS department of facilities uh, either does not have the expertise within the group uh, or they are already very swamped. So in these circumstances, plus the experience of doing modeling is, is very critical and having interactions with the regulatory agencies is very important as well when conducting modeling exercises. And as we, as we spoke before, is one of the questions was on the timeline. That timeline becomes very critical for companies is that I mean, they will be at a position in which I need to start production in Six months from now, uh, well, they have to submit an application which includes a modeling um, modeling assessment into it as well. So, and you have to take into account the time taken by an agency to review and approve and issue a permit. So, considering all those cases, uh, it is very there is a very high likelihood that uh, facilities would choose uh, a consulting company who has experience in doing these type of modeling assessments. Um, as well as having good interactions with uh, uh, with state and local um, agencies uh, is important as well. So, so it is generally a good practice, and that's what we have seen uh, is towards going towards a consultant who is experienced in it is a much because if you think about it, um, an EHS manager typically comes into place of, of there is a project already up there. We know it. It is coming there. Our timeline is six months from now. So that's the so they are always at the wall with the time. It is always a general idea that they come to a consultant. Which I, I definitely get because obviously time is money. And if you guys are experienced at working with agencies and getting the modeling up and running, then you can provide a, a great benefit to companies who might not have the resources to do it on their own without the consultant. So thank you for that. For that explanation. Um, I think we probably have time for maybe one more question and then we'll kind of wrap up um, in a summary. So can this model be applicable to gas station emissions as VOCs? I can, I can take that one, Jessica. Um, Great. Right. When, when, we, when we model gas stations, so yes, the model is really applicable for almost any type of source and that doesn't mean that it's going to give you, uh, you know, accessible results or you know, not too conservative results, but you you could you know you could it is applicable for most sources. In the case of VOCs, what we would be modeling would be you know, usually just air toxics, and that's going to depend on whatever the requirements are for the state. Thank you, Pilar. I appreciate you going into that detail. And I know from talking earlier, Santosh is going to kind of give us. A few takeaways that he, he really wants attendees um, watching live and then on demand to get from today's webinar. So, Santosh, you want to go over a couple of things with our audience today? Sure. Thank you, Jessica, for that. Um, so, 
few key points I would say is, first of all, um, have early discussions as soon as you know that your project is uh, is kind of imminent and is going to be worked through, whether it's going to be at the design stage or a little later after that. Uh, make sure that a modeling assessment is required, then do start early. Second is uh, always make sure to have open lines of communication with your local regulatory agency, because that will be a key part in one, understanding the requirement for your particular area. And that will also help you to determine if you are going to take into account external help through a consultant, that you will get a better idea at that time um, that whether you would need it or an external help or you will do you can do it yourself. Um, and I, as with modeling, I and with other cases as well, I would always say that uh, get started on it early because you do not want modeling to be a bottleneck, uh, um, especially if your concentrations are pretty high and if you're dealing with uh, toxics as well. That make sure that you. Uh, and that said, that that's with the caveat that some states do not have toxic regulations. So I would put that caveat as well. You may be okay in some states, but uh, but you will have to think about the criteria of pollutants as well. So those would be my uh, two primary takeaways, Jessica. Thank you. I do appreciate you going over that. And I do appreciate all of the attendees who were able to join us live today, as well as those who will be watching it on demand. We did have a couple of questions come in about a copy of today's presentation. You do have the ability to download the slide deck on your attendee console, so please take advantage of that. If you would like to rewatch this presentation, it will be available on demand within the next two to three hours, so feel free to rewatch it again. And if you have any questions for today's speakers, feel free to continue to submit until we close up or add them to the survey, which will pop up on your screen at the conclusion of today's event. I do want to thank Pilar and Santosh again, as well as your entire team at, at Montrose Environmental. At this point, we are going to conclude today's webinar, and I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you, Jessica.